Um, welcome back. Uh, my name is Brett Solomon. I'm the executive director of Access, accessnow.org. Um, welcome to day two. So we have a jam-packed day full of sessions. Um, and I know a number of the rooms were very, very busy uh, yesterday. And in fact, a lot of people didn't actually get into the sessions that they wanted to. Um, we actually designed the conference intentionally um, to be a kind of intimate environment. So those rooms were meant to have like 30 or 40 people in them. Obviously, there was um, lots of demand on particular sessions. So what we've done is had a look at the program and moved a few things around. Um, so I'm just going to quickly tell you what they are before I bring out the all-star panel um, for this next session uh, on known unknowns of the NSA surveillance program. Uh, so the public-private surveillance partnership myth or reality, which is, was in the fireside room over there, is moving downstairs to the platform. And protecting user rights, practical issues facing early stage companies is moving up to the fireside room. That's in the next bracket of time after this session. So basically the platform and the fireside room are swapping. Um, and then at 12 o'clock, the um, cyber peace session moving beyond a narrative of global threats is moving in here. So they're the two key changes. There's some in the afternoon as well, um, but I'll let you know about them later. And Michael Carbone is looking at me because there's one other announcement, which is that um, in the demo room, which is downstairs, and I'm not sure if everybody has been to it, but it's through the cafe and outside and then back in, which is where all the tech demos are happening and the lightning talks. Um, Storymaker, is going to be tomorrow at 10.15, and CryptoCat is going to be today at 10.30. So they're swapping with each other. And I just got a thumbs up, which means that was correct. Um, OK, without any further ado, um, unless anybody else in the audience has an announcement they want to make. No. Nope. Um, let me introduce Amy Stepanovich, um, and Barton Gelman, and Marcy Wheeler, and Marita Shuck. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two. I hope you all got a lot of rest last night because we know, we all know we have a busy day ahead of us. Um, I'm not going to introduce this too long. I do want to spend a couple seconds talking about the incredibly intelligent people to my right and then try to let them talk um, amongst themselves and just really have kind of an informal conversation. Um, we will be accepting questions from the audience via Slido. Um, so the URL should be behind me. Feel free to submit a question, and I'll look up and try to put those into the conversation quite a bit. So all the way to my right, I have Bart Gelman. Um, Bart is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation and a lecturer at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School. Bart is also one of the journalists who has been given access to Edward Snowden's treasure trove of documents, and he's been one of the lead reporters um, since June on this issue. Um, next to Bart, we have Marcy Wheeler. Marcy is a blogger at EmptyWheel.net, um, also known as Empty Wheel on Twitter. Has been leading um, national security reporting for years and years now. In addition to many other jobs, I encourage you to look at Marcy's biography because it's incredibly interesting and she's had a very fun life. But Marcy is here as a really an expert on the executive authority of um, executive surveillance authority. And then next to me, we have Maricha from the uh, member of the European Parliament, a Dutch member of the European Parliament. Um, she is a member of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, the Aldi political group. And she's going to come and bring us our European perspective on surveillance authority. So I'm going to open up with just a question to see what you guys kind of push you a little bit. And that's... You know, we're told a lot that secrecy is important in national security. If you don't have secrecy, you can't conduct efficient surveillance. You can't protect people. Do you think that there is a role for secrecy in government surveillance? And what role is that? And where does that stop? And give an argument against that. Give what the best argument is against your own point of view. Is that it? <laughs> uh, 
All right, so if you start with the basic proposition, the obvious one that information is power, uh, then you have a combination uh, in these surveillance uh, stories of uh, sort of radical transparency of the people to the government and uh, complete opac opacity in the other direction. So it's like we're living behind a one-way mirror when it comes to uh, surveillance. And so there, there are certainly aspects of that that need to be equalized or penetrated. Uh, Clearly, uh, national security considerations, some of which are real, um, require secrecy in some cases, but secrecy is not coincident with security. Uh, one of the more interesting things that was found by uh, the last really sort of big government secrecy commission uh, chaired by uh, Pat Moynihan already uh, 20 years ago uh, was the observation uh, that there were a number of core secrets during the Cold War uh, that greatly impaired security. Uh, just for example, that the, uh, the official estimates of the US government of uh, Soviet economic and military power were grossly inflated in ways that, had they been subjected to outside scrutiny, uh, could have been demonstrated. And that secrecy led to the, to the sort of needless spending of trillions of dollars and the distortion of social priorities and so on. Uh, the way I see the secrecy dilemmas here um, is that there are sometimes direct clashes between two really big important interests, uh, and one is self-defense and one is self-government. And my view is that there is no competent authority uh, to make those decisions, to draw that boundary sort of in general, and so that it has to be drawn by a process of competition, which is what we have now, which is that the secret keepers try to keep their secrets and um, the secret seekers like me try to find them out. Uh, and you have an equilibrium, equilibrium brought about in somewhat the same way that you have uh, in terms of classic market economics. Uh, it, it, you don't go around and ask the local store, uh, how dare you set the price of milk? Uh, my baby needs milk, milk's important, why do you get to do it? Uh, but that's not a very good description of how the system works as a whole. I would add, um classic example of a time when secrecy actually hurt the United States is the Khalid, uh, the, the Khalid El Meldar story, which they always use to justify the phone dragnet. They say, if only we had known that the call was coming from inside the United States before 9-11, we could have found two of, the, two of the hijackers. But in fact, they knew enough to, to, to at least find those two hijackers in San Diego and didn't share the information. They were keeping secrets from themselves. And that actually should be pointed to as an example where secrecy made us less safe. Um, and I think, you know, to add to what Bart said, is I think, you know, it'd be nice if we got to a point where we talked about a Second Amendment right to metadata or a Second Amendment right to counter surveillance because it's, it's a similar kind of, you know, the, the entire point of the Second Amendment in the United States is to have some countervailing power to the government. And the, the, it's not just secrecy that is at, at issue here. It's that the government wants to have an, a monopoly on these tools of surveillance and not be subjected to the same kind of surveillance themselves. I mean, everyone always says, what if Dianne Feinstein, what if Dianne Feinstein had to give us all of her call data? She would very quickly change her mind about the, both the, the intrusiveness of phone metadata and also whether or not it's a privacy, you know, um, it's not gonna happen though, so. I think in Europe there's culturally perhaps uh, somewhat of a different understanding of the relationship between the citizen and the government because in many of our countries not long ago there were vast secret services uh, collecting all kinds of information on their own citizens. And so protection from the state is I think a more publicly appreciated uh, notion. Um, and I think that national security um, and all the uh, necessary measures surrounding it uh, can be measured against the public interest. Uh, and it should be, of course, subject to democratic process in terms of where these thresholds lie, in terms of where the checks and balances are, in terms of where the ultimate responsibilities lie. And on the one hand, that requires, I believe, an understanding uh, and an acknowledgement that there is no such thing as 100% security. Uh, there will always be 
surprising or unexpected things happening, black swans or whatever you want to call it. But if you go by the starting point of seeking to achieve 100% security, that can lead to all kinds of crazy measures. Like I read that there's now a plan to actually track each and every car because then you can trace back who has been speeding in with 100% certainty, for example. Well, that would be like saying, okay, we're just gonna arrest everyone uh, because then uh, sooner or later we'll figure out who has committed a crime that was yet unsolved. I mean, the proportionality and what's in the public interest and what is uh, uh, responsible behavior by the state should all be very much a part of this discussion, which I think should be bound by very clear laws that protect the citizen from the state um, as well. And as we see more and more technologies factoring into this um, field more reliance of public actors, states on private uh, actors, this kind of accountability questions, checks and balances become even more uh, complicated, but are even more urgent to, um, uh, to get very, very clear. And that's what's lacking right now, I think. The technologies are developing so fast, the laws are lagging behind, there's a huge vacuum and um, uh, a lack of transparency that's very difficult to catch up with. I think maybe I didn't address your question as squarely as I, I could have. So best argument against disclosing this stuff uh, is that, just say from my own decisions about what to publish, that I could be blowing some capability or some operation that is actually producing uh, foreign intelligence in a way that sort of most people, mo certainly most uh, people who are citizens of the government doing it, would regard as legitimate, important, that's sort of what they're supposed to be doing, protecting the country. Uh, there are two sets of problems. One is that uh, a lot of times the operations which could potentially be useful, or I, I can see from documents actually are useful, uh, are intertwined with uh, sort of domestic kinds of surveillance or, or crossing of boundaries that um, at least represent sort of new policy decisions that one would expect uh, the country to debate in principle publicly, right? So uh, obviously breaking the codes of the enemy uh, is a fundamental job of the NSA and one that has been sort of a legitimate part of its charter since it was created. But the problem is that it's not World War II and you don't have uh, sort of, you know, the, uh, you know, the purple code or the enigma code uh, that is unique to the enemy. Uh, the enemy in general, not always, is using uh, using uh, the same basic forms of encryption that everyone uses to protect their information. So it then becomes uh, a different sort of question about whether you disclose the extent to which they're, um, they're capable of breaking those sorts of codes. There are some examples um, in the documents in which there's a, a set of uh, security tools uh, used primarily or only by a uh, particular intelligence target, and I'm not writing those stories. So I think you've all touched a little bit on the importance of, of being safe and security and what these programs can do. So I want to ask what keeps you up at night? Like, Maricha, as a, as a member of parliament, and Bart, you, you obviously have documents that you're not supposed to have. Is there something, either from a macro level, from a government perspective, that you think is out there that you worry about or maybe something a little more personal that you worry about happening? Like, what do you go to bed worrying about? I sleep very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, my gosh. Only jet lags keep me awake. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think there are many massive and massively complex issues to worry about. I, I mentioned yesterday in my introductions, but I really think this is true. I think we're at a point where we have to sincerely re, re design or redefine the meaning of a democracy. I mean, how can it be that in the name of security, security has been systematically eroded and freedoms have been given away? Uh, under the guise of uh, external threats, this has clearly been an internal erosion. Uh, that worries me because I think what we've seen, uh, especially because of uh, all the stories coming out um, uh, of the, what the NSA is capable of, it gives us a sense of how far developed these mechanisms already are, how many missed opportunities there have been to slam the brakes, and it's very difficult to, to fight back. I think uh, in the public we see 
uh, people being upset. There is a quick education process, but it's also overwhelming. Uh, what, what can people do? What can people not do? Uh, who holds the power to this? I mean, we see the same uh, in Europe with regard to the responses to the NSA. All the governments have used very strong words vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the United States, but when push comes to shove, they don't want to do much mm -hmm. that's really substantial. And it is most likely because they're engaged in similar activities and or exchanging uh, data on a daily basis. Uh, and so I, what I worry about is how to rebalance this, because I fundamentally believe that we are weakening uh, our own open societies this way uh, in a way that our, let's say, legitimate enemies could only dream of. And our credibility in the world, where I do think the United States and Europe could and should play uh, a role in advancing uh, fundamental rights of people, uh, people's well-being, has also lost credibility. That's something I worry about. I mean, uh, it's much more difficult to talk to human rights defenders in countries where they actually risk their lives every day and to try to alert them to programs where they say, oh, yeah, what well, these are funded by um, uh, European and American companies or governments, forget about it. Yeah, I mean, I, my impression from here, looking at Europe, is there's this, you know, urge to yell a lot not necessarily because they are opposed to the spying, but because they want to be let in. They want to be the seventh eye and the eighth eye, and the, you know, they, want to, they want to have as much access to NSA and GCHQ data as the rest of the five eyes. And, and, and one of the things, one of the horrible potentials is that you have these governments that are all sharing information at the same level that the US and the UK is currently sharing information, and and they together can just you know, squash their own people because they have that level of dragnet. But the other thing is, I mean, I, I'm just barely now getting access to some Snowden documents through First Look Media, and so I'm at the stage where you may have been you know, eight months ago, nine months ago, and, and it's, you, know, you have to worry about the NSA. You have to worry about protecting communication from the NSA, but you also have to, and you know, I'm sure you can elaborate on this, you have to worry about Russian mafia. You have to worry about other governments who would love these documents. You have to worry, I mean, and, and the, the, the list of people who would like these documents is very long and very awesome, in a, you know, in a very, that, that's sort of a keep me up as newly in the last couple of weeks. I don't know, want to add that? Uh, yeah, that's for sure been part of it for me. Uh, I mean, if you start with the proposition, which not everyone does, that there are things in here that ought not to be published, or ought not to be, and that is Edward Snowden's view as well, otherwise he would have dumped them all on the web, which he was more than capable of doing, uh, both by his deeds and his words uh, to me. Um, he, wanted, he wanted me to, and, and the other journalists involved to look carefully through there, try to figure out what was in the public interest, what was a story, what it meant, um, and hold back the things that would do needless damage. Uh, so if you start with that proposition, then you have an obligation uh, not to leave the stuff laying around where um, any competent um, hacker um, and certainly a, a foreign government with resources could get it. And so uh, although I was actually over the years uh, pretty uh, far out there in terms of digital security, and if I hadn't been, I wouldn't have been able to talk to Snowden, uh, I've had to take further steps, but, you know, kind of to elaborate on, on your view, I mean, I got one of those Gmail uh, banner butter bar warnings that, uh, that Google believes uh, a, uh, a government-sponsored attackers are trying to compromise my account and my computer. Um, I doubt that that was NSA. I assume that that was a foreign government interested in material that NSA already knows, and they don't. Uh, but as far as, and as, far as uh, what the, the reactions of other governments uh, to these disclosures, and, and also private companies. But does that put the U.S. Yeah. government in a different position or difficult position? In other words, uh, would they be inclined to recognize this risk and then help protect your information? <laughs> well, I, I mean, my threat model for most of my career has, has been the U.S. government in, in the sense that uh, Almost everything I want to know as a, as a national security reporter or as an author of books that touch on those things uh, is classified. If it's not in the testimony of the press conference, news release, um, then it's classified because it's national security, it's foreign policy, and I've spent most of my career on that stuff. So I didn't want the U.S. government to know who I was talking to. 
as part of my motivation for learning the sort of tools of encryption and anonymity and other sort of best practices. Uh, and so I'm not inclined to ask for government help <laughs> on, uh, here's my computer, um, please help me secure no, no, it. Uh, I didn't mean that. Yeah. Maybe they would offer. I mean, it they could be in their offered. interest, I'm just. They, they, they haven't offered. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a peculiar thing that I, I guess I'm willing to mention in public. I haven't before. Um, we do have conversations about stories I'm going to publish. I want to know context. I want to authenticate the information that's in the document. I mean, a thing can be written down on paper and not be true um, or be radically out of context. Uh, and sometimes they want to uh, make a case to me about something that I don't know that would affect my decision about what to publish. And literally since the first day, the first story on PRISM in June, I've been asking them, how would you like to communicate in a more secure manner than, you know, sort of open email or telephone conversations? And they've yet to give me um, a secure channel that I could talk to them on, which I find surprising. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of bureaucratic reasons that I can imagine. I mean, they're not allowed to talk to a non-classified computer about classified things over classified channels. Uh, they're not allowed to use their non-classified computers and networks to talk about classified things. They're sort of in a bind of their own regulatory making. But it seems to me that they could solve this problem and ought to. But I think that's a really good example of, of where secrecy is not about protecting the country, where secrecy is more a bureaucratic system of you know, drawing lines you need to do that. You know, if you want to get the bureaucracy to follow the rules, you need to have lines like that. But, but both with the Snowden documents and with the WikiLeaks documents, I think there was this kind of willful stupidity on the part of the government because they wanted to pretend classified is still classified. And you know, they, 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 and it's, it's. It's a facade at this point. I mean, we all know some of this information, but the government insists on talking to you as if you don't know it. Well, I mean, it's the product yeah. of, of a number of practices, regulations, uh, sort of ways of behaving that, you know, any of which are perfectly rational on their face, uh, but put together and, and in a different context lead to senseless results. I mean, you can understand why the government would not want to say anything that is um, that is leaked, uh, that's classified, um, is thereby declassified. Uh, I mean, you can imagine why, why you know, the rules ought not work that way. But then if the rules are such that if, you've, um, if you're a mid-level diplomat meeting with your foreign counterpart um, in the foreign capital, you're, um, you're supposed to uh, pretend that you don't know what was in the leaked you know, sort of diplomatic cables uh, that was said about uh, that country, and so you know your counterpart is either going to think you're a liar or an idiot, um, and yet the the rules seem to require them to behave that way. So I'm going to take this top question from the screen behind me. Do you think Snowden was acting out of his beliefs, or were his revelations just part of a complex geopolitical struggle? The FSB Wait, uh, question. Uh, <laughs> Oh, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so if the question is, was he operating under the sponsorship or with the intention of assisting a foreign power or foreign security service, uh, there's just simply literally no evidence for it. And beyond that, uh, the, the publicly known facts just don't make sense that way. They don't, uh, you know, wh why is it that he's, uh, that he's held at the airport in Moscow for over a month, why is it that uh, he gets only temporary asylum? I mean, don't you think that someone who's prepared to sell secrets could get a better deal than that? Uh, he, he, but, I mean, the list is very long. You can't account for the known events with any plausible theory of foreign sponsorship. Uh, I know a little bit more about um, how this all happened than I'm free to say. But the U.S. government has come up with enough understanding of, of how he did what he did and what he did exactly uh, that, that it knows that he, he didn't need foreign help. And that, quite interestingly, 
when uh, uh, Chairman uh, Mike Rogers of the House Intelligence Committee started going on TV not so long ago and trying to revive the idea that he was a Russian agent uh, through very nearly saying explicitly a lot of insinuations. Um, the, uh, the government first told a former head of the uh, National Counterterrorism Center who goes on TV a lot, Mike Leiter, um, that it was nonsense, that they, they, they knew it to be untrue, and he then said so. Uh, and then actually uh, government officials themselves started saying it. Um, they don't believe that it's true. I mean, he, I think you can take him at his word about what he wanted. I mean, he's, he's given quite direct and explicit and detailed explanations of, of uh, his behavior. He became witness to uh, things that he thought raised significant legal, moral, and policy questions that were not in the public uh, debate. That view has been validated by the extraordinary fact that eight or nine months later, we're still talking about this as a front page story, which had he asked me at the time, you know, what are the chances that I'm going to uh, launch a global year long sort of, you know, sort of A-list debate, um, I would have said, sorry, that's just not the way it works. Uh, I mean, no story happens this way. The fact that at least one federal judge has found uh, the program as currently constituted uh, uh, to be unconstitutional, and that along the way, several judges have found iterations of it to be against the law, is, is sort of a basic validation of, of, uh, of his view. I think you could take him at his word about what he was trying to accomplish. So I'm going to ask one more question and go back to the screen. Um, and this is maybe targeted toward Marcy, but I'd love to hear what the other speakers have to say. Uh, Marcy, you've done a lot of work piecing things together. Um, from documents on the record, from things we've learned from the Snowden revelations, and trying to make kind of everything make sense. Can you talk a little bit about that process and maybe about some of the interesting things that you've learned by just like looking at every single piece as a whole instead of as individual slices? Um, I think we know what we don't know. Um, Bart and I were just talking before we... That is the title of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like just as two examples. One is um, most people, I mean, people come to me repeatedly and say, why, why aren't we seeing PayPal documents? And my answer for that, why aren't we seeing, you know, PayPal, largely because of Piero Omidyar, why aren't we seeing PayPal documents? And my answer is usually because that would go to FBI, because it would be a narrow, more narrow request and it would be more tied probably to the WikiLeaks investigation and therefore it would go to FBI. And you know what? We don't have an FBI Edward Snowden. And a huge part of the surveillance that the United States does is done by the FBI. Obviously the CIA is a part of it. The DEA is a huge part of it, right? And they have their own authorities that come from, you know, inside the White House, shall we say. And we're not seeing any of that. And they, th those programs, particularly CIA and FBI, do tie in with the NSA, and um, we're just beginning to scratch that surface. The, the other thing is that um, we are, the, the government, I think, has pursued a very deliberate strategy since June to focus on two narrow authorities, on Section 215 and Section 702. Um, they're both legal. They both go through a court. They both have some degree of oversight. They both have um, stories that the government can point to where they've fixed their problems. But um, Richard Clark at a, at a congressional hearing not long ago said, you know, that, that's just a, those, I mean, 702 is big, but Section 215, the phone dragnet, right, which is what we mostly talk about, is just a tiny bit of the, inter, of the metadata dragnet that the NSA engages in. And I, you know, I, I, Bart's reporting has brought out a lot of the other kinds of metadata they're collecting, where they're collecting it, what they're doing with it, how it all fits together. There's a bunch of, you know, pieces of software that, where they take those pieces of metadata and, and that's where they develop pictures of who people are and who they interact with. Um, and we're getting pieces of that, but I think we're being deliberately distracted from the fact that the dragnet is much larger and much you know, is, is much more vast than these two programs that the government can point to and say, look, it's legal. I, I agree. There's been surprisingly little debate uh, on this aspect of what Marcy's talking about. So for, for people who aren't all the way down in the weeds on this, uh, 
uh, Section 215 of the Patriot Act um, lets the government, uh, under legal compulsion, obtain uh, business records uh, that are relevant to an investigation. And for a long time, uh, the FBI was reassuring us and DOJ was reassuring us when they started having to disclose statistics, which at first they didn't want to do, don't worry, we're not using 215 very much. I think in 2009 they said it was 26 times, something close to that. It turned out that 12 of them got you a trillion records. So uh, now we're talking about 215. We're talking about Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, which, which is the basis for PRISM, which is the basis for uh, requiring companies to hand over uh, user information, which is content, not metadata. Uh, what they're carefully avoiding conversation about and what the presidential commissions have ignored um, are all the programs that are done not under congressional statutory authority and not under the supervision of this special court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, but are done solely on the president's own authority under Executive Order 12333, right? So th this stuff, uh, Congress knows very little about. Um, the new, the incoming uh, head of the National Security Division of the Justice Department, uh, as Marcy was, I think, the only one to point out, uh, just testified that that's more or less outside his purview, so it's not even getting all the internal executive branch oversight. Um, and that's where a lot of the most intrusive and the, and the biggest sort of mass programs are taking place. And so my own reporting uh, with Ashkan Sultani has focused on those sorts of things having to do with uh, breaking into the private links between uh, Google data centers and Yahoo data centers, uh, uh, sitting on private, sort of sitting on big internet pipes and collecting everything that looks like an address book, um, or uh, sitting on the uh, sort of the central highways of the telephony uh, global networks and grabbing anything that looks like location data for a gigantic uh, location database. Uh, these are big mass surveillance programs that Congress knows little or nothing about, um, and that even if you're interested in it, as I know not everyone in this room is, solely on a U.S. domestic uh, set of considerations, it has huge implications. I'll, I'll just say one, one more quick thought about that. So we had this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that tried to regulate surveillance after the, abu after the abuses of the 1970s. So around uh, the 1990s and, and going forward, U.S. governments were saying, we need to, we need to reform that because the world has changed. Um, and for example, it no longer makes sense to uh, protect every communication collected inside U.S. boundaries as if it were um, intercepting information from Americans because global networks now <coughs> pour all kinds of communications through the U.S. networks. <coughs> Pardon me. What nobody said is U.S. communications are traveling over the global networks. Let's accord more protections there. Right. In 2008, we had a compromise, support, supposedly, which is that um, we were going to let the government wiretap within the United States without warrants in certain circumstances, allegedly targeted at people overseas. And in response, they were going to protect U.S. persons overseas. That was supposed to be the bargain. Um, the second part of that bargain I think is not happening the way it was sold to be happening, but also there wasn't the counterpart. At that point in 2008, we should have said, if, if these networks are global, then the notion that you know, it's necessary to go to Google and, and get content in the United States without a warrant, then it should also be necessary to protect Google's servers in the UK, which we now know they're not doing. So, that, and, and, and there's one more issue here as well, is that when you get into this solely on executive power issue, I think you're really talking about um, scary questions of separation of powers. And I think that's one of the reasons why Congress and the courts make really dumb decisions at times. And it is that they are terrified of the implications. I mean, the, the reason, David Chris, who used to be a top DOJ person, has implied that the reason the FISA court made what on its face is a really stupid decision to allow Section 215 to be used to collect you know, most of the phone records in the United States is because they needed to bring it under some kind of court review. You know, it, was, it was better to have a bad legal decision than it was to have the executive branch doing this all on their own. And that's the logic. Thing is, the, the, the authorizations for the executive branch to do it all on their own still exist. They're still active. They haven't been withdrawn. 
plus there's this bad legal decision um, and a number of them. And I think that that's the, that is, and, and Congress is the same way. I mean, I think they would rather have this fantasy that they have some control over this. They're beginning to get scared about 12333, um, but just now beginning after eight months. Um, then to acknowledge the fact that they have a fundamental separation of powers issue. <laughs> so I think a lot of the questions behind me have to deal with reform, and we've, all, we've talked a little bit about this, Bart, you brought up reform, but have you seen meaningful reform, this comes from Cyrus at Ars Technica, um, in the last nine months since the Snowden revelation started, what would you like to see in a, re in a real reform? And since part of this discussion is talking about executive authority, so authority that presumably just exists inherently, what can be done to reform that? I think one of the, one of the really, it's important for people to acknowledge that um, US companies are getting hammered by this. And, and some of that is opportunistic, I think, in Europe to say let's cut into their business, but some of it is, you know, it's, it's real. And I think the, you know, for better or worse, Google and Twitter and Yahoo, well, I, Yahoo has its own problems, and even Verizon, I think, are going to be important partners for change if there is going to be any change. And that's why I think Bart's decision to publish some of the names of the partners was fundamentally important. Because the government wants to keep these, the identities of the companies that are cooperating with them. I mean, that's one of their top secrets, right? If, if, we, if we know for a fact that AT&T is handing over our phone data, it becomes a lot harder. Well, AT&T would do it anyway. But it, you know, we know for a fact Verizon's handing over our data, and so it's a lot harder for, for, you know, Verizon, I suspect Verizon may have taken secret moves over the last eight months to make it harder for the government to get everything from Verizon. And we know that they tried to do this, maybe Verizon, maybe somebody else, tried to do the same in 2006 when this was first becoming public. And so, um, you know, for better or worse, the corporations are going to be one force for change. I mean, my, my view, which unsurprisingly puts uh, some value in the kind of work that I do, is that transparency is a great enabler. Uh, you know, it, all reform, quote unquote, doesn't come from, you know, sort of a, a big agreement or change in statute. Uh, transparency enables all the institutions of, uh, of, of civil and public society to participate in public decision making. And so when you know what's happening, then public opinion can shift and it can thereby shift the, uh, the views and the behavior of members of Congress who had gone along with something sort of easily without very much debate over the years. Uh, it enables uh, market pressures on private companies to change their behavior. There is, because of all this transparency, really for the first time there is an emerging market for privacy. I mean, it used to be you couldn't buy privacy at, at any price, and there, it was nobody's business model, or virtually nobody's, to, to offer privacy, and uh, it, it fit almost nobody's business model to do a whole lot of disclosure um, or to take expensive steps for security. And so when we published the stories that said that the government was intercepting traffic between uh, foreign data centers for uh, Google and Yahoo, Yahoo, which had not been an early enthusiast for encrypting its links and encrypting uh, sort of user accounts, uh, announced plans to do so. Uh, so likewise, uh, because Verizon Business Services was named in the Section 215 FISA order showing that it, it was turning over all the customer call data records, um, that allowed uh, a revival of lawsuits in US federal court. Uh, which had been previously thrown out on grounds that the plaintiffs couldn't prove that they were actually affected, that it was a speculative case. You don't have standing in American courts if you can't demonstrate for a fact that a thing has happened to you. So just because you have strong circumstantial evidence doesn't get you there. The case was thrown out. Now uh, cases like it have been revived because, for example, the ACLU can say, actually, we are customers of Verizon Business Services. We now know for a fact that our communications uh, with our clients, which are highly sensitive and privileged, are logged. Now we can, now we can uh, move forward in federal court. At least we won't be thrown out on grounds of standing. There are a lot of different ways that transparency enables pushback. 
Yeah, I think I see a few developments uh, that are similar in Europe. On the one hand, the public is simply becoming somewhat more aware on a on a broader basis. Uh, last week, it uh, became known that since Facebook bought WhatsApp, 30% of Dutch users stopped using it. I think that's quite a significant signal that would not have been the case uh, one year or two years ago. Uh, and I think on the one hand, you will see uh, more legal proposals that had been in the making in Europe anyway, now getting more um, visibility, such as data protection regulation, etc., uh, which will potentially in the future enable uh, a more um, market-driven uh, pull towards Europe uh, because it, it will allow for stronger safeguards when it comes to uh, people's fundamental rights. Uh, and so I think that is uh, a response from the market. Um, to a few other trends that we're seeing, and I'm not sure to what extent that's happening here, but we see a number of court cases uh, being brought against the government in the Netherlands, one against the Minister of the Interior um, who is sued by uh, a group of citizens and, and NGOs for uh, whitewashing uh, NSA data. And this court case has led uh, the minister to actually make available in the public information because he was forced to do so in the court as well. I mean, it's of course reverse order of events, but it did uh, make them feel like they had to release that information also in the public. Wait, could, could you actually elaborate on that? Because the idea that you could sue a public official for making a false or misleading public <laughs> statement uh, is alien to me in the US context. I mean, what, what's the... No, the, the he's being sued for uh, whitewashing, as they call it, just like money laundering. So laundering data is actually the allegation, which I don't think has ever been brought. So it's also, in that sense, going to be interesting to see what comes out. So the lawyer and these um, uh, citizens... Is it sort of like in the United States, they're parallel constructing uh, legal cases so that, you know, they, until last year, were not telling defendants that they had used these authorities against them and instead invented other subpoenas. Is that it? No, this is a grassroots okay. um, case against the government where these citizens say, you, Mr. Minister of the Interior, responsible for uh, our intelligence agencies, have willfully used illegally obtained data uh, or have shared it with those who, who you knew would deal with it outside of the legal framework. So you should compare it to how money is being laundered, but now it's data laundering. So we'll see what comes of that. There have been um, other cases as well uh, brought by lawyers who are afraid that their uh, privileged uh, communications with clients have been compromised. So we see um, also that kind of movement. And uh, I think there are some procedures that are now being reviewed um, for example, in our uh, national parliament, so I serve on the European parliament, but in our national parliament we have an oversight committee, which I think most people now agree is, is dysfunctional, but um, it is supposed to provide for a confidential uh, space for oversight of the intelligence services, which means that all the heads of political parties represented in the parliament uh, are uh, briefed, briefed in a classified way to have some form of oversight. Uh, and so uh, my political party is now calling for parliamentary inquiry, which uh, allows for hearing people under oath in the parliament to see what is going on um, uh, with our own intelligence services to know to what extent uh, we are cooperating with uh, the United States. And then uh, as a result, hopefully, if this would happen, uh, much more information would come to the table and would probably lead to proposals to review some of the procedures that we've relied on uh, that are outdated or dysfunctional or, or whatever. So there are, I think, a broad set of movements in the markets before the courts uh, in, the, uh, in the parliamentary system. Uh, but, you know, by and large, it's not enough. Uh, but there are, I think, different hooks from which to work uh, if you want to try to uh, push in the right direction. I also think the cybersecurity question is going to be, um, is an interesting point of pressure in that, A, it is a real problem. It's, it, it is a bigger problem to your average American or your average European, the notion that your target data is going to get stolen and you're going to have all these new credit card fees, right? Um, so it is something that people experience in their day-to-day -day lives. It is something that needs to be fixed. And then you have the one that the people in DC are worried about, that China's robbing us blind and stealing all our DOD secrets. Um, and I think there is a very important debate to be had, which experts are having, but I think it needs to be broadened, 
about what the best means of solving that problem is. And you know, we've had these kinds of conversations already here, but uh, making encryption less secure is probably not the solution. No. Nope. And, um, and right now, I mean, Keith Alexander keeps saying we need cybersecurity legislation, we need cybersecurity legislation. I think there are interesting questions about how they're using cybersecurity certifications under these authorities in the United States in ways that they really shouldn't be using in the United States because they end up targeting unattributable actors who are actually Americans and therefore it should be illegal. Um, and so th there's a need that the government has. And I think given the fact that the government has a need that we are now given more information about what the government has been doing to security behind the scenes, um, we can have a more robust debate about how to keep the country secure online. Um, I don't know what the solution, and I'm not optimistic that DC will have a same policy discussion, but I think it is one that will be had. Well, and internationally also this notion of American citizens being treated completely differently than foreign citizens, which happens to be uh, us, uh, has actually uh, royally pissed off a lot of people in Europe because in all of the reform proposals in the US, this distinction still wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, in focus, where uh, it, it's not, uh, difficult to see that the presumed risk coming from countries uh, in the EU might be somewhat different than, than other countries because, of course, in so many contexts we operate as allies. Uh, and so I think that that has also led to a real, uh, regardless of what our services do, but this notion and this uh, rhetoric has made people um, quite right. upset. Although, I mean, no, no U.S. politician has proposed to treat foreign nationals with the same protections as Americans, but the president did offer a, a, uh, a kind of a standard to hold him to uh, in his January speech. He, he was the first president ever to say uh, that uh, the U.S. government would consider the use of its signals intelligence in such a way that it would protect the privacy of all people, regardless of nationality, who don't pose a threat to the United States. Um, that's a very hard thing to um, hold him accountable for or to oversee. And there are but, still big loopholes in it. And there are big loopholes in it. Uh, CEG footnote five of his uh, presidential directive the same day. But uh, it, is, it, is a, um, it is setting a norm that, can be, uh, that, that, that he can be held to um, in terms of diplomatic relations and journalism and elsewhere. Yeah, well, and on that threshold also related to cybersecurity, I think soon also in the context of internet governance questions, uh, we'll start to see discussions of reciprocity. I mean, if the United States is allowed to do ABC and then if other countries do it, we already saw a little bit of that, I think, um, in this uh, leaked phone call with Victoria Nuland where she actually said, um, uh, fuck the EU. Um, and it reveals a couple of things. One, apparently these phone calls are vulnerable, right? Or these conversations. Two, it was difficult for the US to get very angry with the Russians because spying. I mean, that was more difficult. Um, so I think in the context of what other countries are now going to feel free to do, it will be... Uh, we might have some fun with it, you know? No, I mean, <laughs> they, I think they have they decide to start laugh. leaking each other's No, head. I think they had a great laugh. Uh, and I think they also knew exactly where it would put the United States vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Europe, which, of course, is uh, uh, of interest for, for the Russians. But if you look at the discussions around, um, you know, how how central the United States and U.S. law and U.S. Uh, practice and businesses are uh, in this whole uh, digital environment. Um, the ways in which we're going to deal with balancing that out, setting norms uh, that are acceptable uh, beyond just the United States and that are actually enforceable, I think will touch upon all these kinds of issues, offensive capacity, defensive capacity, accountability, public-private cooperation. Uh, and these are major challenges, but perhaps this will also prompt uh, a few of these um, issues seen from the outside here in the United States. This is a, a possible side explanation, by the way, for this uh, Victoria Newland uh, telephone conversation. Certainly, obviously, she did not intend for that to be published on the internet. It's not a certainty that she did not intend for it to be overheard. Uh, it, it, is, it is a practice of, uh, of, of, of national security officials and diplomats I know sometimes deliberately to choose a non-secure channel to say something much blunter than they would say 
in person um, in the expectation that the message will reach its intended recipient. So RightsCon is a, is a product-driven conference. I don't think we come here to, we definitely come here to have these big conversations, but we want to take those out into the world. So I want to ask all three of you, what's next for you? We've talked about where you think the conversation should go, what you think the government should be doing, what people should be doing, just a bit, but what is your next step? Tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Oh, uh, yeah, all right, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try to stay in the transparency business. Uh, so I'm gonna be doing some short-term journalism, and I am working on a book about the sort of growth and development of the surveillance industrial revolution. And uh, so I'll be trying both to put new facts uh, on the record and to contribute some thoughts about that. Uh, I'm not trying to propose any particular reforms, but I'm trying to enable uh, the more debate about what the reform should be. I'm, yeah, I'm just, I sit there in my little room and read documents and I'm gonna to continue to do that. <laughs> Marcy yeah. tweeted a while ago, the most impressive notebook collection of documents I have ever seen as somebody who loves organization. She oh, has yeah. them all. I, I, I aspire to plant a, a, an orchard in the name of Edward Snowden because I know I've killed enough trees printing out those documents, so. Um, well, if I get reelected in, uh, in May, uh, it would help me continue to work on um, creating better um, understanding of politics in the technology community and of technology in the political community. I think without uh, a solid understanding of what technologies could do or, or actually already do, we will not have um, appropriate oversight. We will not have relevant laws because there are still too many people uh, holding political offices that, that have no appreciation or insufficient uh, understanding of what um, is possible. And so then it's very difficult to make uh, accurate laws. Um, and also specifically, I'll be working on internet governance quite a bit, I think, uh, over the next couple of years to um, look at the intersection of technology and, and foreign policy, where I think also the foreign policy community has to be brought on board. Uh, because it is diplomats that are often represented in these international fora where discussions and decisions are being made about uh, the governance of the internet, and whether it can stay open, and whether the user uh, and his or her well-being is actually taken on board or not. Um, and so I think uh, that's going to be uh, a little bit of my focus, besides all the stuff we have to vote on and make sure it goes the right direction. I hope the audience will join me in thanking our three speakers.